wonderful, blessed in the name of thank you with your family and that sort of thing. A lot of times we hear phrases, comments uh, from a lot of times our parents, sometimes our grandparents, as we're growing up, uh, and uh, I know I heard this uh, from my grandmother, uh, the phrase, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. And you may have heard that phrase as well. Uh, so tonight, we're going to do something a little different, maybe, because we're going to look at some phrases that I'd like for you to actually actively, you know, participate using your fingers, if at all possible, to count. And see, how many of these, as we go through the Bible, how many of these uh, phrases that we probably have heard before are really in the Bible? Uh, we, we say that we in the Church of Christ are people of the Word, and we need to be of the Word, and we need to study the Word, but we need to make sure that what we say is, is really from God and not from our culture or tradition or upbringing only. And there might be some overlap. Sometimes the exact phrase is not actually maybe in the Bible, but maybe it is. And so that will be incumbent on us tonight as we go through several of these. The first one, here's the, here's the phrase. Spare the rod, spoil the child. I'll give you a second to think there. Spare the rod, Spoiled child. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. yes. <clears throat> Are you sure? <laughs> Not worth the word. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. The proverb author says, He who spares his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him properly. He who spares his rod hates his son. So the Bible encourages fathers uh, to use at some time in the upbringing of the child, his son, it says here. I think probably sons and daughters as well. But he who loves him, his son, disciplines uh, him promptly. If you look at Proverbs 22, one more verse related to that. Proverbs 20, chapter 22, and verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, uh, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. And so this is inspired by God. We believe that. It is in the Bible. And so we understand that a rod of correction, uh, a stick, a branch, some kind of instrument that we use, hopefully not too hard, uh, will correct the child. Uh, the rod of correction will drive it uh, from him. Actually, the phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child, as I think Brent said, is not really in the Bible. Like, uh, we just mentioned here. Now, we've used that many times, but it's actually from a 17th century British author of poems that actually coined that phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child. Now, is the idea in the Bible, of course, we just read a couple of scriptures here, but that particular phrase, as we say, is not a direct quote from the Bible in that sense. We're not going to debate about, you know, specifics, but I'm just saying that exact phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child, is not directly in the Bible. The idea is there. So that's actually a no. At least the way I've checked it here. The second one, salt of the earth. Salt of the earth. That phrase, salt of the earth. We A lot of times we say we're to be the salt of the earth. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? I see a no. You can do this or this, just real quick. I see one no. It is. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And this is not to make anybody humiliated or any of that. It's just for us to kind of look at some passages 
in a different way. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, I'm using the New King James Version, so there might be a little difference in the versions. It does say, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men, and you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor did light a lamp and put it under a basket, but in a lampstand it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before me that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so if you're looking for that exact phrase, you are salt of the earth, that is actually in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 and verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. And we are, as Christians, uh, we are to be the salt of the earth. Number three, pride comes before a fall. How many times have I said that? Many times to my children. Pride comes before a fall. Is that in the Bible? Well, we have one Bible scholar here that's saying yes. <laughs> I'm not a Bible scholar. No, no, I'm, not, I'm looking back beyond. I'm looking back beyond you. Uh, and uh, I have a couple of takers on that. Uh, believe it or not, it's not in the Bible. But the idea is Proverbs chapter 16. If you'll turn to Proverbs chapter 16, and you feel free afterwards to call me out if you see a different version of uh, this, but I think these are pretty much right. Uh, pride go, comes before a fall. It actually says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Well, as we know, a lot of people can be prideful and maybe not have a haughty spirit, although sometimes people that are prideful are haughty, looking down their nose, thinking that they are something more than they are. They don't have that humility. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil uh, with the proud. And so there is the idea that if you're prideful, yes, there is probably going to be a pit of destruction, a, a, a fall. But the actual phrase, pride comes uh, before a fall, is not in the Bible, unfortunately. Number four, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. Is that in the Bible? We've got a taker. Think it's two, three, four, five, six. Sounds, sounds more like it, doesn't it? It is not in the Bible. This too shall pass. Um, it actually sounds like it should be in the Bible. It is true that things will pass and life will pass and things will pass. But the actual origin of, of that phrase is from a 10th century poet in England. And he said that pass so too may this, this too shall pass. Uh, and so the reason I'm pointing these things out is not because that we're trying to play cat got you, but just for us to be aware that, that, that many times we may think things or say things, even in the church, that may not be what God said. Uh, it's what we say or what we heard or tradition. The thought may be there, but that actual phrase is not. And that's kind of what we're looking at tonight. The fifth one, God helps those who help themselves. God helps them who help themselves. I've got one saying no. What do you think? <laughs> Several of you are like, who cares about that now? I've missed so many. God helps those who help themselves. That also is not in the Bible. That actually is a phrase from Benjamin Franklin who quoted somebody from a century or two before that. Uh, if you look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, and I've looked several of these up and tried to research it enough to, to, to make sure that I am right about this. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And so the Bible actually says that God helps us when we can't help ourselves. That actually we cannot help ourselves. There's nothing that we can do, especially in terms of salvation, uh, for ourselves. Uh, this actually is a phrase that comes from, you've heard of Aesop's fables called Hercules and the Wagoner. Uh, and that's where it comes from. The gods help them that help themselves. Sounds like Bible, and it is true that we are to help ourselves. 
But this phrase, God helps those who help themselves, uh, is, is not in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 4, the Bible says, uh, Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 4, For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength, talking about God, a strength to the needy, uh, in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the last of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. But I hear the uh, prophet is talking about God, O oh Lord, you are my God, and I will exalt you in all the things that God will do. In other words, God is a present help in time of need. But that actual phrase is, is, not, is not in the Bible. And so if we ever say, God says this, we would technically not be correct. What about the phrase, skin of my teeth? Skin of my teeth. I did it by the skin of my teeth. That actually is in the Bible. <laughs> it actually is in the Bible. Uh, if you turn over to Job chapter 19, Job was talking to God and he was uh, questioning to a certain extent God. Uh, but in verse 20, Job said, My bone clings to my skin. And to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. That's interesting. If you read the whole passage, and I wish we had time, I guess we could actually do that. Uh, it might be well worth our time. Uh, if you move over to verse 25, that Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh, flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. If you should say, how shall we persecute him, since the root of the matter is found in me? Be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Here Job is talking to God, and he is in torment. And he, verse 2 actually says, how long will you tor torment my soul? He's talking to God. And break me in pieces with words. Ten times you have reproached me. You are not ashamed that you have wronged me. And if indeed I have erred, my ear remains within me. And so here is Job that in a point in his life, a very low point in his life, he, he, he's not sure where the punishment is coming from, which is what his three friends are telling him, that, that you're so bad, Job, and so sinful that God is punishing you, which was furthest from the truth. But even after all of that, he turns over and he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And we sing a song, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. But in verse 20, he does say, I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. That is how he felt. And so yes, that is actually a phrase that comes from the Bible. Here's another one. To thine own self be true. To thine own self be true. In the Bible, not in the Bible. Sorry. Not in the Bible. Uh, that's actually a phrase from Hamlet. If you remember Hamlet, uh, from Hamlet, uh, I have a quotation here, the phrase doesn't matter exactly where it's found, but neither a borrow or a lender be also is from Hamlet. But he says, to thine own self be true. Uh, and Benjamin Franklin's almanac, uh, if you remember that, contains many of those kinds of phrases that are mistaken to be Bible verses. And so to thine own self be true, that is not in the Bible. Here it is. Money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is the root. This is easier. Money is the root of all kinds of evil. We know that's not in the Bible, right? And we know why. Because it is the love of money. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. God created everything to be good. He created a certain way for us to negotiate and to exchange. And uh, he gives us uh, our jobs to make money and to, if we need to store it and save it, to be good stewards of it. Uh, and so that actual uh, quote, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, the love of money uh, is. But money is impartial. Money is neither good or bad. It just is, just like everything else. And so money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, it is not in 
in, in the Bible. The love of one of these. By the sweat of your brow. Sweat of your brow. Is that in the Bible? No, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. If you turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, it sounds like it ought to be. It actually says here, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, God tells Adam. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so that phrase, sweat of your brow, is, is not there in the sweat of your face. Of course, your brow is part of your face, so if you want to be really technical, then, then, then it's the idea. But the actual phrase, sweat of your brow, is not in the Bible. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Is that in the Bible? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It couldn't be, right? But it's not. It's not. In Genesis chapter 3, three verse 19, we just read out this here, for dust you are to dust uh, you shall return. But people say ashes to ashes, dust to dust, don't they? All the time, a lot of times at, at funerals. How about eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth? Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Is that in the Bible? It is. Well, Job was an elder, he knows that to be correct, and it was. <laughs> Genesis chapter, or excuse me, uh, Ecclesiastes, Excuse me, I'm looking around with my glasses. Exodus chapter 21. Uh, Exodus chapter 21. You might want to write these down and look them up a little bit later and study on them. Exodus chapter 21, uh, verses 20, 23 uh, through 27. Um, but if any lasting harm follows... This is the, the law of Moses given to them, of course, by God. You shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. And if a man strikes the eye of the servant or the eye of his maid's servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out his servant's tooth or his maid's servant's tooth, he shall let go him go free. Uh, for the sake of his tooth. And so, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that is found in uh, the Bible. Now here's the one, cleanliness is next to godliness. My grandmother would have sworn that that was in the Bible. But it's actually not. It actually is not. It is, uh, kind of, in James chapter 4, and verse 8, draw near God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Not talking about physical cleanness, but spiritual cleanness. Cleanse your head, hands, you sinners. Clean your hands. When the Bible talks about lifting up holy hands in prayer. Uh, it's not talking about in song, it's in prayer. And, and when we lift up holy hands, that's to be significant or symbolic of, of we have no blood on our hands. Our hands have not hit or stabbed or have blood because of us murdering somebody. And so... Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify uh, your hearts, uh, you double-minded. God moves in mysterious ways. God moves in mysterious ways. Is that in the Bible? God moves in mysterious ways. What do you think? Somebody wants to picture. <laughs> we sing a song, don't we? God moves in mysterious ways. He wonders to perform uh, that actually is not in the Bible. Is it wrong to sing that? Well, no. God does move in these mysterious ways. But in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. It actually also comes from a song, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And he does. But the phrase, God moves in mysterious ways, is not in the Bible. At their wit's end, at their wit's end, is that in the Bible? At their wit's end. Nobody wants to venture that one. To say no, actually it is in the Bible. Um, some of us are hitting 100%, 100%. Psalms 107 and verse uh, 27. 
They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at uh, their wits' end. It's actually talking about sailors. Sailors, they're out in their ships and the ships rise and fall. The battle goes up, the battle goes down. It goes towards heaven and comes back down. And they are at their, their, their wits' end, knowing that they cannot uh, save uh, themselves. And it, with their uh, reading, Psalms 107, uh, most of the entire chapter. Uh, a fool and his money are soon parted. A fool and his money are soon parted. Is that something that God said? No, it isn't. Uh, that came from Thomas Tusser in 1573. They put this in a book. A uh, fool and his money are soon parted. God will give you more than you can handle. God will give you more than you can handle. Is that biblical? Is that Bible? A, a direct phrase. Quote, it is not. It is not. It is true that God will not allow you to be tempted, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, above uh, that which you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape uh, that you may be able to, 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 to escape. And so 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and also James 1 speaks of temptations, that temptations are there, but we don't have to actually bite the mouse trap with the cheese in it. We don't have to actually uh, go there. And so we probably all need to read our Bibles a little closer, a little more. It wouldn't hurt if we actually quoted uh, quotations from God's Word, actually as we're singing. Maybe some of the songs that we sing may not be exactly uh, exactly right. We might need to examine some of those and see, is this really from God or is this something that man made up or is there some kind of license uh, there in the song? But tonight, those are about 15 or so, and I'm sure there's others that we can look at, uh, but hopefully this will encourage us to study, to read. As I said, it's not a, a pass-fail, it's just an exercise, a little bit of frustration, isn't it? Because it sounds like things that ought to be in the Bible, but maybe it's been passed down by tradition, and actually the idea can be found in God's Word. Tonight, if anyone needs the prayers of the church, please come as we stand. Uh, 15, uh...